Hi, this is Jeroen, and this is Anchorman's AI Journey. Tune in to get inspired by the opportunities, impact, and capabilities of data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Together with my colleague Ron, we will be talking about developments, best practices, and lessons learned from the field. So get ready. Welcome to the fourth edition of our AI Journey podcast. Today we have uh, a very interesting guest, Patrick Beitsma, uh, together with my partner in crime, uh, Ron Dorch. We will be asking Patrick about everything related to IoT in the context also of AI. So, a uh, short introduction, Patrick. Um, you are a data activation architect at Anchorman. Yep. Uh, before that, I, I, I glanced at your LinkedIn. I saw you've, you've actually worked at, at Oracle as a consultant, and you've also been a CTO at, uh, at WebPower. Yep. And I think that's also how we already got acquainted uh, uh, via Anchorman. And um, you are also, uh, and I'm allowed to tease this a bit, uh, working on a white paper on IoT for, uh, for Anchorman, which yeah, will be one published of the, on the... Yeah, one of the white papers I'm working on. So... When did you get interested in IoT and what actually is IoT? Whoa, uh, that's a difficult question to start with. Um, what is IoT? Uh, did, um, let, let's Maybe let's do the, the timeline first. When did you get interested in IoT? Um, the first, I think that was probably six, seven years ago. I mean, and, and it wasn't even called IoT. It was like, okay, getting data, getting stuff connected. That was actually where it started out. And then you saw new technologies coming out and, hey, I like to play with stuff, see what it does and figure it out. And then you see these new technologies. Hey, you, you, you're, you're, we're slashing boundaries here. Now it becomes easier to connect stuff. It's easier to have something like, wired or even uh, wireless connected and, and get data from it. So I think my first real IoT projects, I think it really started off when I think there was this Kickstarter campaign in Amsterdam, which started out in Amsterdam in 2017 or something, where they did like uh, with uh, the Lora One technology, they right. had like, okay, they, they, they set up like this COVID hole Amsterdam with an IoT network in about three or four weeks yeah. with just some upcoming technology. And then it was, yeah, it became just much easier to, to connect your stuff. And then I said, hey, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. It becomes cheaper, it becomes easier. And, and yeah. well, I do a lot of, well, experimenting at home, for example. With yeah, it. And LoRa is this, this wireless network technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can cover it a little bit later. But it, it, that what I think really made me aware of, hey, IoT is moving forward uh, right. a, a lot. And then so it became even more interesting. So I think that's already uh, like three, four years now. So so IoT, uh, it stands for Internet of Things. What would you describe as a, as a typical use case uh, within the IoT realm? I, th I think it's... Um, every device you somehow connect to a network so you you can gather well data from it uh, or and maybe sometimes even two ways but i think the most use cases is just start measuring stuff uh, uh connected up to something and use that data for whatever well use case you can think of i mean and some of them are like I think a, a good simple example was the, what they did in some of these parking spaces uh, mm. and, and parking garages where you now have the red and green lights of the, of the free spots right well, I think, uh, of course, that could be done like decades ago, but then every every parking spot had to have, get wires and stuff like that, way too expensive. And now they can just do, put like small sensors, cheap sensors into the floor and have these lights and do everything, well, uh, remotely yeah. uh, and wirelessly. And so why, that, why do we need a different internet then for that? Why is it called the Internet of Things then? Well, I think it's, 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 it's not a different internet. It's still the internet. Uh, only, only it is now, in, instead, we were used to that only people are participating in the internet and now things are starting to participate in the internet as well and so they um uh they use the same infrastructure basically but does it change the internet in any way the fact that things are now well i think it will and it actually does already i think there was a i don't have the numbers with me but uh, i said in, in the past people were connecting to the internet so we as people were adding information data to the internet and now things are adding information and data to the internet. And there are more things, much more things than there are people. So they, the things will be adding much more data 
to the internet, information to the internet than people ever can. Yeah. Plus, so there will also be devices talking only to each other. So yep. not even devices notifying humans about something, but even devices notifying other devices about yeah. events that are occurring. So that you can even segment the internet into a separate network that's only devices talking to each other. Yeah. And I think technology-wise, you see a lot of, I mean, because the internet, I mean, in the, in the past, it was like one technology. And nowadays, it's already a blend of a lot of technologies. And you see that which uh, IoT-related technologies are becoming, well, at the edge of the internet, you can say it at the edge, but where is the This is, a, this is, a core, is the one edge? of the core concepts. What, what, what is the edge? Well, I think uh, it, it's, it's hard to describe what really is an edge. Uh, I mean, if, if you, from a techn technological perspective, you look at the internet and say, oh, this is where we have uh, uh, TCP data uh, flowing around. Uh, and now we look at the edge, hey, we have devices connected in a different way, not by a cable or a Wi-Fi, but use other radio technologies or other wire technologies and use different protocols. But then at the edge, it makes a type of a protocol switch. So coming from, well, a very technical protocol which is not really easy to understand or easy to use switch to the protocol that's more like on the internet itself uh, easier to, uh, to to read and to work with so what do you mean with the protocol is like a communi way of communicating yeah exactly i mean we, we know have we talk at the internet we look at um, um, websites and we have uh, um, rest apis and we have all these technologies on the internet that we are, are now used to to communicate but those devices probably use some other more uh, detailed uh, technologies uh, in there. So they're not that easy to understand. But if you translate that to, again, for a REST API or a, a message protocol that's used all over the place, uh, then you have like, that, that's done at the edge. So that's where you see. Uh, so you the edge makes it understandable somehow. Uh, whereas yeah, I in think the, or is it the opposite? No, I think I think that's it's what you see. It's, it's where it makes the transition from uh, your local, and then, yeah, we can go into that, what, what local it means here as well. You have now these, these uh, terms like fog computing, which you see nowadays, where we have the cloud on one end and we have the fog on the other end. The, the fog. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. very, very misty. So, so, so just, just <laughs> to summarize, the edge would be basically the protocol boundary from TCP IP, uh, which you have maybe over internet, uh, uh, Ethernet, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but then you have... For example, you have maybe sensors on farm animals. Mm -hmm. And then these sensors, they send their data through an edge, through a, a, a collector point that maybe uses... Um, well, LoRa, for example. For example, example LoRa, yeah. or, or you know, radio waves, or maybe even 5G. Yeah. And that last step from the sensor, uh, the, the, the thing, the uh, Internet of Things, the thing, to um, the point that actually connects it to let's say, proper internet, Yeah. Um, that is the edge. That the edge. boundary is the okay, edge. Okay, so the sensors, the things, they live in the edge? And it's, 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 I think it's related also to the concept of edge computing because uh, yep. there's so much data being sent by, by sometimes by these things. Yeah? For example, I've heard about gas turbines. They send like, they have like these, the, the frequency their sensors operate, they, they generate gigabytes of data per second. Yeah. Um, and that's too much to do any meaningful aggregations on that, maybe in your central data center, which might be in, in the cloud. Yep. So that's what how, how the concept of edge computing came about. Comes in, yeah. Maybe, and maybe you can clarify that a bit more. What edge, yeah, edge maybe you had a, a good example to, to, to have the whole chain visible. Huh? We, we talked about LoRa One. You have this, for example, uh, a sensor on a cow you mentioned. It is a good example. Um, you don't have a wire to the cow, and it's not. It's, you don't put a Wi-Fi device on it because, and we'll go in some details maybe later. Why Wi-Fi, for example, is not a good example. But so you say, hey, I have this sensor with uh, which is battery operated, and it uses LoRa One technology because that works very well for these type of examples. Low energy, uh, don't have to have complex uh, radio waves technology. So that's there. But then this signal goes out, needs to go somewhere. It doesn't fit on the internet right away. So the cow is not directly connected to the internet. No, the cow is The cow the doesn't edge. have an IP address. The, the, no, the cow, no, right. So, yeah. so the cow is what we call would be in the edge. The cow would be at the other side of the edge. At the exactly. other side of the edge. So yeah. we have the cow. Then we have the edge, which contains the like the sensors or the devices. Yeah. No, and it's no, no, it's no, the cow. The and sensor is at the other side of the edge. Yeah. Maybe I've had complete the example. So 
yeah, let's have, let's, have, let's uh, do the full picture. Let's <laughs> we, do the full we have picture. the cow with his sensor on his back. Yeah. So that's that's the thing yeah. that's on the back of the cow. Yeah. That's putting in this example uh, its measurements in, into radio waves. Yeah. Then we have another device, which is the edge device, okay. which picks up these radio signals. I see. Uh, and understands those radio signals. And hey, let's train change this to the protocol that the rest of the internet uh, uh, knows. So th that's where the protocol change comes and then sends it through uh, there. Okay. So that's a very simple function of the edge. But say now it's not a cow, but it's a gas turbine which has sensors running at 70 right. kilohertz, for example. So we have 70,000 measurements per second. Um, that, uh, sending everything through to the internet somewhere in the cloud, that doesn't make sense. It's just too much, it doesn't work. Okay. So the edge says, hey, let me receive those 70,000, for example, do some processing on it, uh, some edge computing, and then make the relevant part of it, send that through. And now you have, of course, things, have this example, for example, 70,000 even, LoRaWAN, for example, isn't fit for that particular use case. You could have a more a sensor that has some more intelligence in it, with, I do the 70,000 measurements and I'll do some lo local aggregation and then send the aggregation to the airwaves. So that depends per use case okay. where you do stuff so, like that. So I get that. So we have, we have, we are now, uh, we collect all the signals, we do some computations, which we call edge computing, and then that gets sent to the internet. And then you mentioned cloud and fog. So what, what is that's somewhere on the internet? So what's that? Yeah, well, it, it, I think if you look at the the thing and the edge, those two live in the fog because it's they're they're not living in the cloud because it's probably a local device. I mean, we're here in the studio and but say ma maybe that's a nice analogy. What is fog? Fog is a cloud on the ground. Yeah, well, I, I think for me it's like fog is it's very misty. It's 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 <laughs> unclear. I mean, we know have the, the the concept of cloud we already understand. So I think that's where they, they tame the because it doesn't live in the cloud. But where does it live? We don't really that's know misty. exactly. Yeah. It's misty. It, it it could be the cow itself yeah. or the, the so it's it's all over the place. So it's very foggy where it resides. Um, so the so okay. So the fog is on on say the human side of the edge, right? Or the the cow side of the edge. Uh, but nah, the edge, maybe, maybe I'm taking it too far now. But for but me, the edge for me is part is yeah. part of the fog. Yeah. Okay. The and the edge would also be uh, kind of putting it in terms that you understand <laughs> is where you would do your first uh, statistics collection. Okay. So uh, where you would maybe even do your first feature selection or okay. your feature uh, your feature engineering because okay. otherwise it's just too much data to okay. send. Yeah. So we can also we also get in the realm of which we can discuss later. Uh, but just jumping ahead a little bit of for example federated learning. All right. So, um, wh wh what are some exciting developments currently in the IoT space? Five, I think, uh, is 5G exciting? D definitely. Uh, I mean, I think uh, when I refer to the Kickstarter campaign, where I said, look at LoRaWAN, and I'm looking at other technologies as well, what you see is, um, I mean, Internet of Things is, is actually quite old. I think they did it already in the 80s and 90s. And I mean, the easy use case uh, is for, uh, for, say, for example, a factory. If you have a very expensive machine, and you need to keep it running, you're going to put sensors on it to monitor it. So those sensors were already there. I mean, if you have a very expensive machine, it's fine to spend thousands of, of euros on it to do some monitoring. But there are a lot of use cases where it would be interesting to do monitoring on stuff, but it's too expensive to put sensors on it and collect that data because in the past it was just too difficult and too expensive. So the use case and the benefit of having that information uh, 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 yeah, it, it wouldn't work. Um, and now you see these new technologies like uh, 5G, uh, narrowband IoT, LoRa, and all these uh, SigFox, and then there's some others as well, which are all in the wireless uh, uh, realm, by the way. Um, they make those things much cheaper to produce, easier to connect. Uh, so the use cases and, and lower power consumption. Probably. Well, that's a very important one. For example, if you have a sensor. Um, and you need a sensor, you, it, it needs to get powered. So logically, if you do it by wires, then you, you have it there. But if you have to make and wire everything, it's very hard to put sensors in place. So you, let's say, let's put them in batteries. Mm -hmm. But if you have technology and a sensor that drains your battery like uh, in a week or in a few days, and you have a, a, an organization or, or your cows, for example, you have uh, 5,000 cows with a sensor on its back and you need to replace batteries uh, like every day or every week, that doesn't work. So you need also like uh, different technologies that uh, work on low power. And that's where, for example, uh, narrowband IoT come in, uh, uh, LoRaWAN as well. They have technologies in place where uh, radio communication, which is in a sense power hungry, 
uh, becomes less power hungry. So it's optimized. So it can work on batteries and you can have sensors now uh, where you put in a battery and it, it runs for like a year or even longer. And that's also one of the reasons why Wi-Fi is ruled out, right? Because it's Exactly. Power Wi-Fi, power. Wi-Fi is yeah. by the, the way it, it needs a lot of power. It does a lot of communicating. If you would a sensor using Wi-Fi, and even Wi-Fi is not really reliable in a sense, so at least a lot of communication, your battery will be drained within a day, probably within a few hours. So that's why, for example, a technology like Wi-Fi doesn't work. But a good example, you, you mentioned 5G. Um, I think on 3G and 2G, there were already like machine-to-machine communications. You have like uh, sensors where you can just put in a, a SIM card and then you start communicating. But in the past, for every, well, everybody knows it from your phone, your SMS message, you had to pay for those back in the days. So machine-to-machine is just sending SMS. So if you have sensors and if you, even if you're measuring like every five minutes or something, you have the same 5,000 cows, you can imagine what the cost would be for the farmer if you just have to pay for all those SMS messages. That would be re- reduced then to maybe use cases like, hey, maybe uh, the grain silo is empty, for sure. example, or so like sure. at a critical level. At a critical you, level. Yeah. And if you have, I mean, if you have like a very expensive uh, container to track, then it's fine. I mean, if, you're, uh, if you have to track a, a million dollar container, you, you can pay for the cost of those SMS messages. But for the use case for the cows, it just the cost of just the SMS messages itself is already uh, so too much. So this is one big challenge that uh, in development of IoT had to be solved, right? So how to make uh, the sensor parts cost effective, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's where you see a lot of changes nowadays. The new technologies, 5G comes into play and all the other ones, uh, making it easier and cheaper to communicate. Uh, using less power, so sensors in itself have become uh, cheaper to do, uh, less maintenance as well. And also what I think is very interesting is, what uh, you know, the makers movement nowadays where, where where people like your Arduinos and stuff like that. 3D printing. Yeah. 3D printing, all these things. I mean, in the past, if you would say, I, I have a use case for my sensor uh, and you need to uh, build a sensor and let your uh, sensor uh, be uh, uh, manufactured somewhere, it's very expensive. I mean... I need 10 sensors. Nobody's going to manufacture 10 sensors. I mean, 100,000, a million, fine, but not 10. So all, all those use cases as well in the past, it just even the manufacturing part was too expensive. But so, now you can actually say, oh, I have 3D printers. I have all these stuff like that. So I have components in there. I can tinker around and, hey, I need 100. Fine, I can build 100. And then from there, uh, step on. So all those use cases now, I mean, it, it becomes more just more feasible to at least start trying. Everything is cheaper. It's easier to produce now. Uh, uh, so. so is this now a solved problem or is this something that still needs in, in, in dire need of further development? No, I think it's, it's, I don't think you can consider it actually solved, but I think uh, a lot of hurdles have been taken. So it's become much, much more easier. I mean, it's now open for a lot of companies to say, I can look into this area because I can, I, I can start with low cost. I can start with uh, low volumes. I can start experimenting with that and figure it out. I mean, again, yeah. this this multi-million machine, that's fine. That, that's what they covered in the 80s and the 90s because then it's, hey, you can spend 10,000s of euros on it because uh, there. But all the other use cases, they're, they're now coming into reach. And that's, that's why you see also this explosion. Well, maybe that's a, that's a good segue because now that we've set the scene of where the data comes from, what can we actually do with the data? Well, I think that's that's the same thing. I mean, in the past, we already said this this this, this machine, a very expensive machine, the monitoring in itself, and when was it running too hot or not? That's for the engineer was so important, so it had this light on it. I mean, and that was just keeping the machine running. Collecting the data was a problem in the past, so they didn't. They just looked at the light; it was either red or green. But we are actually measuring a lot of measurements. Now, if we say, hey, we can now start collecting this data, this is where IoT and big data, in a sense, come together. I mean, I don't like the term big data anymore because big data was a problem in 2005 and six. but now these volumes aren't a problem anymore, so they're not big data anymore. Uh, and yes, we're going to have bigger sets, but I don't think that we're at the same level as the problem we had in 2005 with big data. I think it's not really a, that problem anymore. Um, but you see, ha- having all these measurements in place and start collecting those, now we can start to learn from that data. Instead of having wait for the light to go red, we could actually already see the temperature rising for a long term and see, hey, we might be hitting this soon or later or whatever it is. So we can actually start using that data as well. And well I think what, what are some of the challenges of using uh, machine learning in IoT? Pooh, that's, that's a good question. I think... Uh, what we probably have to learn uh, uh, there is that um, 
IoT data comes from an envi- from, from, from different environments. So uh, let, let's, for example, take a, a temperature sensor. This is an easy example. And you can you can measure a temperature. But actually knowing more about where these measurements are taken is something you want to take into account because otherwise you're just comparing measurements. I mean, if I'm, I'm measuring in the Sahara and 50 degrees means something else than measuring 15 degrees on the North Pole. So I think and that's, if you look at uh, machine learning and things like that, Hey, it's not only the measurements you need, but you need to start thinking about what do I need to know from the edge and actually from the device as well to take into account what this measurement means. And uh, exactly, and maybe as an extension of that, what we meant with with edge computing, whereas with maybe in more um, traditional uh, user data based, uh, people data based Mm -hmm. use cases, it's usually just, yeah, just send all the metrics. Yep. Just send everything, right? Send everything and uh, we'll figure it out. And if we, we, it's better to have it than to need it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, although I would say that knowing what it means also in that context is very important. So, you know, whether a click means one thing or the other depends also on context. Oh, 100%. Yeah. But you mean the 100%. sheer volume and the fact that it's it's limited, what you can send, makes it more important to make you, these kind of decisions. You're already condemned to making a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas uh, before yeah. you might advocate like, okay, well, you know, just send everything you have and we'll make a choice uh, yeah. in, in, in the, the data center, for example. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll make a choice on the cluster but yep. here you cannot make a choice on the cluster you need to make a choice at the edge yeah uh, yeah and, and of course it depends on the use case and the sensor because for simple sensors where for example uh, you're measuring moisture uh, in in from, from from plants for example fine that those are simple measurements only like once every hour or 15 minutes fine just send everything back to the turbine you need to make your choices yeah because of the fact that you have limited bandwidth or what? What's actually the reason for it? Correct, yeah. limited bandwidth. Limited bandwidth. Uh, and say, same, for, you have a factory and you have a lot of those. So you don't have one turbine, but you have like tens and you have other machines. So you're measuring at high frequencies at a lot of places. If you would say, I'll just ship everything, then you would be uh, swamping your, uh, um, well, you, you don't even get it th- probably through uh, the airwaves. Uh, and even if you do it wired, you would be like sending in gigabytes to uh, and terabytes per second. So how do you deal second. with this uh, challenge? So what, uh, how do you make sure that you get the right metrics then? Well, I think, again, that depends on the use case. I mean, from the turbine perspective, uh, they probably know which aggregations make sense and don't make sense. How do you know? There's people, expert, domain experts. Definitely. You know, the, definitely. the engineers, the actual engineers that built the thing. Yeah. Right. Although yeah. with machine learning, the idea is that, you know, you pick up on features that you might not know are predictive for something. Oh, true. So there, there is a challenge there. Of course, there is. But I mean, at the moment, if you look at, let's say, the state of the art of the technology at the moment, in the past, we didn't have these measurements at all. And now we say, hey, from uh, uh, this moisture sensor, just share everything and we'll figure it out later. That's feasible. Uh, but for the turbines, that's hard. So you say, okay, what would be interesting to see? We do 70,000 measurements per second. Let's say we do uh, the, the, the 59 percentile. We send the, uh, the, the, out, the outliers. We, but is it possible we to make do the set smaller an, um, and send that piece yeah. of data out? And but there is not a phase usually in these kinds of projects then where you know IoT gets introduced and uh, then first all of the data is used, then uh, exploratory analysis is used, like machine learning to see is there based well, on this. Like common sense, so you you have like a bootstrap phase where yeah. you maybe have a server directly next to the uh, exactly like a storage server next directly next to the turbine. Yeah, you collect it for um, a month or a year or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and then you build models on top of that and then you switch to the IoT model. After you know what are the important features. Yeah. Right. So but if this, even the local machine can be considered as IoT in a sense, of course, because that's course. actually, but you said in your example, you're putting an edge yeah. in there doing edge computing. Right. Exactly the the only difference is that instead of the edge being connected through uh, uh, through the internet, you take the hard disks and you just drive them. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, so that's, that reminds that's why me of, 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 of Reed Hastings from Netflix who, who said it was already, uh, at the time when he started Netflix, it was better to just, uh, it was uh, faster to just drive a car full of movies than <laughs> to actually <laughs> upload the movies yeah. to customers, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. But so, so is this like, so let's say you want to start with IoT. Right, you have your tur- turbines or your cows or your 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 whatever the mm-hmm. things you want to measure. Like, is the first step if you ever start out with IoT before setting up the whole infrastructure, before setting up the cloud, is actually demystifying the fog, so figuring out what sh- what uh, features are important. Is this like a first step to make? Like, yeah, okay, I, I, first you need the sensors. Then yeah. you have the sensors. Exactly. Then the next and I think, step is- and then you first have to figure out if you actually have a 
problem in the sense that you need to figure out on the edge yeah? because yes for the turbines it's clear and for the cows don't worry about it so i think at the moment you see most use cases don't have this this this, this edge problem yet yeah? when people when most companies start out just let's start measuring i mean not everybody starts out with measuring the, those high frequency stuff and have the, have this this transport problem here and that let's just start measuring is now feasible because it's so cheap to store all the data exactly into, and that didn't used to be the case exactly right? so and one the of the things is for example now in the past you you had to be most putting sensors in place was especially in existing environments is was quite intrusive because you had open up stuff put in wires and stuff like that and now you can just have relatively cheap sensors being put on the, on the outside, for example. But how do you know what to measure, though? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 hard, because that's where, you, of course, you think about, hey, what's my problem I like to solve? And especially from an engineering perspective, hey, I have I, I like to know this uh, information and we'll do, do more monitoring on stuff like that so I can be, uh, how do you say, uh, aware of things that start to happen. Would, would you say uh, that there's, a, there's a, in that sense, a typical uh, evolution that an IoT project goes through from maybe starting from anomaly detection all the way building it up to prescriptive maintenance, not even predictive maintenance? No, I, I, and could, can you maybe also uh, comment on those stages? I'm not sure if there is a, is a clear path on it, but I, I think, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, Industry 4.0, I mean, why it's called Industry 4.0? Because yeah, why they, is it called Industry 4.0? Well, I mean, I think I'm, I'm not sure what the 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 were again, but then I mean, <laughs> had the... Uh, <laughs> no, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's, your no, it, was, it, was, it was actually, no, I think they, they I, I read about this. So it's a German initiative. Uh, they, um, uh, and it was kind of a, a pun on, because we had Web 2.0. Yeah. And then they, even, they wanted to leapfrog 3.0 and they said we're just going to go to 4.0 directly yeah but i think there's also somebody that has a logical explanation where they were introducing the uh the steam machines and stuff like that which were like industry 2.0 and so they have something else i'm I'm very sorry i made the joke can uh, can we go back to the question (laughs) so what is uh, are there these usual evolutionary stages so i could maybe uh for 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 me from from uh, as as a more an iot layman i I would see like uh, also considering the projects we do at anchorman Mm -hmm. um uh, we we often say we start with something like anomaly detection which is uh, we have this machine and we think something's wrong with that and then you could uh, once you have that infrastructure in place and you have that modeling in place and and all the um uh, the, the, the data collection you could start thinking about and you have enough also enough machines connected so not just one machine but several machines of the same type for example you could start thinking about predictive maintenance which yep. is predicting whether this machine is about to break down had the advantage being I can stop it at my own convenience and repair it instead of waiting until it actually breaks down maybe in the middle of the day uh, disrupting production yeah and I think that's exactly why industry 4.0 is so interesting because that that idea is actually why I say hey now it becomes possible to start measuring uh, and then you can have all those examples you, you just mentioned and I think it's not typically IOT because I, I usually say if you, if, you, if once you have your measurements from your IOT devices, and it's out of the fog into the cloud or wherever process, it's just data. It's it's not different in a sense from any other data we have. The importance being, hey, now we can collect, and yes, we need the metadata from, from, from the sensor because that's relevant as well. Uh, but, and again, after a while, it's just data. Uh, so the, the, the use cases and the way you approach is, I think it's it's the same as you do with other other projects in a sense. Right. But from, from an IoT perspective in, in an industry setting, and indeed, I think usually they start out with a simple use case, see if we can start the measurement in place, get some experience on how this particular fog looks like for them and get the transport in, in, in place. And then, hey, we start collecting. We have this anomaly detection use case. Here. Hey, it, it makes sense to start measuring these things so we can learn from it. And then it grows from there. Uh, and having a basic set up in place and get acquainted with these things, then it makes it easier. Oh, now we can see what we can do. We just add more sensors to it. Uh, we start uh, do measuring more, more, and more environments, uh, different different signals, and things like that. Right, because then you, yeah, you you can predict whether the machine needs needs maintenance, and then the next evolution would be then I think prescriptive maintenance, yep. which differs from predictive maintenance is that it not only predicts whether it needs maintenance, but also what type of maintenance it needs, and maybe even gives the suggestion of, hey, you need to change this filter, for example, yeah, or you need exactly. to change, uh, hey, looking and at the profile, you need to change this O-ring. Or yeah, and I think that's, that's a, it's a good example. Uh, I think one of our customers, they have a, a, a lot of IoT data in as well, and this is a good example for the, the metadata we're just talking about. They said, hey, they have all these pumps, 
And so they, they made it build a machine learning model for the, the pump. And they said, oh, okay, we have thousands of pumps. Uh, we have one model uh, and we just put all of them, uh, all, all the same pumps and the data from them go to this one model. And they figured out, hey, sometime the model is wrong. Why? Because the pump on one end of the factory actually behaves a little bit different than on the other side of the factory because one is on the north side and the other one is on the south side have a have different temperature, different environment works in. So now they said, oh, they, so the metadata from this model or from this sensor actually is relevant. And they actually figured out, hmm, we have a generic approach uh, how to, uh, with what model to use and to train for a pump, but we cannot use a single model. Each pump needs its own trained model. Yeah. Or you need a better model. But that's, oh, you need uh, a better model? Well, no, no, uh, no, but, but yeah, that's, of course. That's of course, right. but I mean... Take, that, taking into yeah. account, for instance, the yeah. metadata. Yeah, but and the fact is, and, and this is, an, uh, this is a, a, a more a nice bridge to something else, which I think very interesting, is putting uh, machine learning into production. And this is a good example again. Hey, we have figured out what model could work. But then from their production environment, they had to figure out that they, they didn't need to run one model, but need the ability to run this model a thousand times. Yeah. So they trained each pump individually with the same model and then run it model uh, a thousand did, versions. Did they, uh, did they actually train it or did they do some kind of transfer learning where they made one generic model first and I then fine the moment they were looking the model at, for the I'm not sure how far pumps. they are at the moment, but I think it, 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 they, the first approach they had, hey, we need to run it multiple times. Right. So that's, that's why these, they looked at, hey, we don't, need to, uh, we don't need to run this model once, but we need to run it for every pump. Right. So uh, I th- I train it for every pump. Train it for every pump, but yeah. actually, oh, they're running because if you do, then if new measurements come in, you have to have it evaluated by this version of that particular model. Yeah, I would I would suggest some kind of looking at Ron here also, then use some kind of transfer learning. Right? Well, yeah, that, that's definitely a possibility, but I actually think that in this specific case, it's a bad example uh, of data science in the sense that uh, the model was apparently trained on data of for just one. Uh, no, it was actually pump? trained by the the data. Of, of all, all the pumps, the pumps. All the pumps yeah. and uh, but then in the in the test set that you maybe have defined, you didn't see that it had uh, a bad accuracy, whatever ah, measure. Of accuracy so it used. sounds to me it's, more it's like that they didn't achieve a hundred percent score on all the pumps. So there were some pumps that didn't work well. And exactly, those had to be uh, fine tuned. Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 of course, I mean, and the fact is, I mean, is it uh, if you have a thousand pumps, and I'm not sure what the exact number was, and maybe it worked for 800, but what to do with the 200, and how to figure out which are the 200 and then the 800? So, uh, I mean, it's not more one model anymore that you're yeah. running. You need to have multiples, and depending, of course, what it is. So they, they, they initially so you, said we have one type of machine, the pump, and we have so we have one model for that pump, and they they figured out hmm, that didn't work. So they figured out there is a one two. And now they said, my in worst case scenario, it's a one to one. So every instance yeah. of that machine has its own model, and they still still start to I figure understand. out what what would be the way for. So I mean, it still costs money, right? Well, it's not like maybe a, uh, maybe it's not necessarily a wrong prediction to a, u- a young sorry a, a wrong recommendation to a user where a user gets gets to see the wrong movie, for example. Well, yeah, I mean that, that's about uh, uh, implications. I think that like yeah, usually in a machine learning, any machine learning, any time you train a model, you want the test set and the training set as much as possible to resemble the distribution of information that you get in production. You mm-hmm. know, yes. And uh, if uh, you train a model that looks fine and then suddenly it does it works for eight hundred and not for two hundred others, it's a generalizability problem. It's actually a problem of the uh, in the training phase not using the data that is representative of of the full scala or full breadth of machines that are being used or the model being not able to represent that you know so maybe you need to use a different type of algorithm maybe it, a neural network but it's or you need to include the metadata plus, plus it's the cost benefit analysis anyway because uh, had the, uh, your metric will never achieve 100 no, percent immediately you, so the question is uh, for some use cases especially with user data it's okay if you are around uh, the 90 percent mark but, but maybe in these use cases because there's more uh, there's there are different costs involved uh, there's a, a different uh, monetary profile if you will then it does actually uh, 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 it is beneficial to do those, uh, I don't know, three decimal places, right? So yeah. go, to go or the nine. And nines. from a technical perspective, it's just a matter of um, you, can, you can automate all, automate all this stuff. So you just have to figure out, okay, I'm I'm gonna put all the data together and train it into one big machine, or let's say we can train it for a thousand and run thousand instances because we then have on an individual level we have a better accuracy, which for the pump makes a business case, which is 
could be valuable. Yeah. Well, if you have the luxury of uh, having all those data sets, and you, then you don't need to be able to generalize. You just make a model for each machine. I agree that that's fine. And maybe the, the model in itself is, is the same, but you just you train them individually. It depends on... Yeah, the, I mean, it's in a sense of detail. I just got triggered by the fact that, uh, that you know, the conclusion of having to train an individual model for each machine is not necessarily, to me, the conclusion that you no, would no, need no, to No, 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 I have. agree. But, but that's fine. Uh, I mean... Th that was the example yeah. why I said the metadata yeah. becomes important. It was an example where you see, hey, uh, what what did we miss? Oh, yeah. now we need to take into account, we start measuring other things like the nearby temperature or the position and make these things... Right. Feed, maybe, uh, maybe then if we measure this, we can put it into a feature and then the model can make use of it. But they were figuring out why doesn't it work because we generalized it for a pump. And then they figured out other factors were in play as well. So wh what are you saying? Like when the model is trained, the work's not done yet? Well, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> no, yeah. In this case, I don't know enough of the details, right? So it it it, it sounds as if as as if this all happened still during the test phase, and maybe the accuracy was not high enough, and then they figured out why is the performance not good enough? Do we need to add more features, right? Yeah. So um, that would be the general, the usual way of doing things. Um, but I would be uh, like I would say that's that's then fine. That's the iterative way of of figuring out how to build your model. Uh, the but bad way the bad way would have been. Uh, seeing we have great performance because we only use a handful of data from a handful of machines and then being amazed that suddenly it doesn't work for your 200 other machines that you have not trained the data on or not included in your test set. Mm -hmm. And that would be the bad example. I just, you know, but apparently it's the first one, which is good. I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but but for me, it was a nice example how, how uh, because what, what I like from IoT perspective, you have a, a connection to the real world. Which, which I really like. And then you figure out, hey, this metadata becomes important. And this, these are examples where this becomes important. Uh, yeah. The digital world and the real world start to interact here and yeah. there are other things in play. That, yeah. It's for me very interesting. In, in that, I mean, maybe a, a quick bridge to something else, but I think really interesting as well with IoT and more the open side of the data stuff. Yeah, uh, I, 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 want, I want to get to that. I Just one more question on the life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, do you actually know of some project that implemented prescriptive uh, maintenance? Not that I'm aware of, no. no. That seems like no. uh, still like a... Yeah, a hail, a I, I think world. the, the uh, and I don't know the details, I think I did, uh, the, the, um, one of the IoT examples that's often used in commercial situations is uh, John Deere. The, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the tractors. Uh, the, tra yeah. the tractors, where they actually came from selling tractors to offering... Um, well, I'm not sure what the, the service is called, but tractor, tractor as, as a, a service, service or something <laughs> like that. Uh, um, but they were as a service. Yeah, yeah. And, but they were able to do so because they were ha collecting data and getting all these predictive and prescriptive models in place where they say, okay, we, we can say, we, we are going to send you a new tractor already, or we're going to make sure you have these additional devices because it's this time of the year and yeah. whatever it is. So the farmer didn't have to re uh, request them he already received them ahead. I mean, it's uh, probably a sales pitch, which is a little bit nicer than uh, the real world. But uh, then again, yeah. So is is maintenance the only uh, IoT? No, use no, no, case? no, no. I think if, if you look covering at, it a lot now. Yeah, yeah. But I think uh, industry 4.0 and industry is where where you see IoT picking up a lot because would, there would, the, the the use cases there are are quite obvious. Can you give some examples? I, I might even argue, uh, but maybe this is a stretch. That, for example. What um, so that maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but for example, what uh, have what Google is doing with the traffic measurements, or for example, Uber, they these they have these phones which basically are acting as sensors of the devices of yeah. the cars, right? Yeah. So maybe abstractly, that is also an have what the, when you when you order an Uber, you see where all the cars are driving. That seems to me like also an IoT. Example. Yeah, I think uh, one of the IoT conferences where I was, there was for example the guys from Picnic, uh, which is actually a real data company. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, because they track all these things in the real world, how the, the cars are moving, what people are ordering, and stuff it's like that. It's a supermarket, huh? It, well, uh, just for the context, it's like an online supermarket. It's an online supermarket, mm, yeah. but I think uh, it's probably better to describe them as a very data-driven logistics mm. company. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they happen to ship. Uh, 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 supermarket sure. products, sure. but they're, I think th that's why they exist so well because they're looking for a different example. They're not saying we're going to build a new supermarket. No, we're going to optimize this logistics chain of these products that people really need, supermarket products. Mm -hmm. 
And so they they had some examples of where uh, um, where they like they're measuring a lot of data uh, and even where uh, uh, the the car with your products is driving, and they were actually like for example in in their app you can actually see where the driver is for example, and they figured out and they said well, let's let's measure all these things and we make it available. What they learned from it, which was a side effect, is that because as a, the, the consumer, you were so well informed about when the uh, delivery guy was at your door, or girl, by the way, uh, was at your door, they found out that nine out of 10 times the door was already open. So the delivery guys and girls were much faster. They could deliver much more. Ah, because it, yeah. it took less time for them. I mean, it was just se- it was seconds, yeah. but they didn't need to ring the doorbell. There were people already at the door. It, it, it so yeah. dropping it off, mm-hmm. it just saves seconds. And if you do that at a large scale, mm-hmm. then it becomes very interesting. So they could do more deliveries at a time. Mm-hmm. So it was like a side effect of having measuring all these things and looking at the data. They found, hey, let's let's make the data available as well. It worked out two ways very, very nicely. So that's a, that's a good example. So um, let's uh, because I know this is also a topic you're very, very uh, passionate about. Let's make that segue into into uh, what an, another possibility that IoT is unlocking, which is that that of open data and citizen data science. Can you explain a bit more what that is and yeah, why sure. why it's important? Well, I think it's uh, we we now said the, uh, we started out with the industry, which is where the use cases are having uh, measuring stuff IoT, which is for your local environment, easy to do, uh, and the use case is very well defined. But if you now start measuring stuff and everybody starts, can easily, it becomes cheaper to have a sensor, it's cheaper to put that data uh, uh, out there. You can now have, I think, I like the example, weather stations. Uh, and we have here in Holland the, the REVM, which do like measurements on. Uh, uh, it's the REVM. Um, they, uh, like, uh, do you mean the CDC? Like CDC? Like where? Is it? You? They're like measuring uh, the dust. Uh, and oh, right, CO2 yeah. oh, and yeah, all right, these right. things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So they have like 10 or 12 official from those uh, fancy stations, st- right. stations with mm-hmm. very expensive equipment and stuff like that. And they're measuring stuff, which you can then uh, also use. But they uh, publicize that data as well. But they also said, hey, if you're at home and you have your like your self-built weather station or you do your own CO2 measurements or something else, you can send that data out as well, for example, to them. And then you can say, hey, you compare that local data with the official data. And the idea behind it is saying, hey, getting this data out there, that opened up new use cases. People like, like, oh, I can compare my data, my environment with the official measurements. And other people can then say, oh, what can I do with this? And I, I like the example. There was, I think it was the uh, in Manhattan where they had the, the uh, and I saw this presentation from the uh, what is it, the, the borough president from Manhattan from a few years back. They had this big problem in Manhattan where um, a lot of people were living in these rental houses, and so the, the landlord has to be responsible for heating and stuff like that. And they had got a lot of complaints about say, oh, it's way too cold in the winter uh, because and the heating doesn't work. And the landlord said, no, heating does work. So what they did is that the the local borough said, okay, let's we have all these weather measurements available. Let's put it, make it publicly, and they also facilitated that people within their uh, homes could do their temperature measurements as well and make it available as well. And with all that public data, there were, and then we go into data hey, citizen science. People say, hey, if I look at this, this is what the actual weather was at that day or that hour, and these were the room temperatures. And of course, if you say one room is a little bit cold, that's fine. But if you now have a thousand rooms reporting the same thing, that is way too cold within these buildings, then it becomes very difficult for the landlord to say, no, everything works fine. So by, by making that, that data out there, you have those use cases and saying, hey, I can do new things. Uh, and, and and make that data available for well whatever everybody wants. So what uh, just to um, because I like that uh, a lot. But so what's the um, the Internet of Things part of this? Is the fact that you are have sensors in your own you build yourself and, exactly and you transmit exactly. it somewhere. The, 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 the fact that uh, the REVM example, for example, you can build it at at at, at home and send it out. Uh, the borough example in, in Manhattan, where you say do your own measurement, and it doesn't. Hey, is, what I like, for example, here is, is accuracy in a sense, um, because of the share volume, accuracy is not that important. I mean, if you have uh, 10 people reporting that it's like uh, uh, around 15 degrees, or you have 100 people around around 15 degrees, and the actual reporting size is 14.8, well, it's fine. 
I mean, it's all about, for example, the trend, and you can you can all do all do uh, do all these things with, with that data, and say, hey, but you have a lot of measurements now, uh, which you can use in the volume and figure out, okay, what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, I, and that's that's the IoT that it makes that possible that people at home. Can actually because otherwise you would have you know if there would have been no IT IoT I would do my measurements and then would have to go to an online page somewhere and put in all the data by typing it in or uh, exactly uh, and exactly now because it's all automated now directly it's being sent to some yeah service, yeah IoT. I, I just for a few dollars you buy such a device put it in your home and you start com- contributing to that mm-hmm. data platform for mm-hmm. example and then you can see hey why, why, how can I use it you can build this this kind of more more democratized perception of, yeah. of the world. What, what I like, for example, with what RIVM is doing with yeah, the, the dust sensors, for example, um, we, we know dust sensors, it's, it's, it's very difficult to have a very accurate dust sensor. And you mean specifically probably fine dust, right? Yeah, so fine dust, for ex- example. Exhaust of car exhaustion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fine dust is a good example. Uh, um, so the, the, those guys have a very expensive equipment, get uh, collaboration every year, and so that, that's it's very, very accurate. But by having people doing it at home within their own environments with relatively cheap sensors, if you have a lot of sensors doing it, you can actually, and after a long time, you can actually learn how the deviations right. are yeah. from uh, uh, your main uh, measurements and figure out, and now they actually say, if you have your fine dust sensors and you're like reporting for a year, you get a correction factor from the RAVM and say, if you use this correction factor, you're probably a little bit closer uh, to the uh, actual value, to the actual or you value. can estimate the true value based on the whole volume of data. Exactly. So, so this is one impact IoT has been having, right? So it's the impact of of enabling citizen science and contributing. Yeah. And what are the other major impacts of IoT that you see, like in general? Well, I, for me, those are the two main areas. You see, in industry, where they're picking it up, a lot of use cases that weren't possible before now become possible. Logistics industries. So that's that's in the commercial environment. And I think the other one is the citizen science environment, the open data part that we can actually have. It makes sense now to do your own measurements and contribute in that sense. And what do you think about IoT in your in your private life, right? So your your speakers, your your dishwashers, your uh... well, in in a sense, I mean, uh, I mean, more, then you are more like in the realm of home automation and things like that, which in a sense are connected devices as well. I mean, it, it's it's fine uh, because it, it it makes your life easier in a sense uh, with with some downsides. But it would be, for example, very interesting to see if you look at your behavior of your lights uh, um, um, and you extract data from it and look at your energy consumption, for example, and you can learn from that. Yeah, I think there are already uh, um, uh, energy companies that are giving you kind of based on your uh, electricity usage, like. A segmentation of what is probably eating energy away from you. So yeah. that, that would be Internet of Things? Question mark? Well, yes and no. I mean, the smart meters, you can actually consider that like uh, an Internet of Things. And, yeah. and here you see smart meters, for example, as a good example. In the, in the past, uh, we talked about machine to machine, yeah. uh, which was very expensive to send these SMS messages. That's why, I mean, smart meters exist already for decades, probably. But we didn't do it because it was too expensive for the energy company. But now everybody has like uh, an internet connection at home, and it's now a safe way to hook up your uh, your meter to that internet connection. Now it becomes uh, feasible to collect that data much more often. So now it's you say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll connect with my smart meter, and I'm fine with sending my measurements every like 15 minutes. Yeah, although I must say, I think my smart meter is actually directly connected to the uh, to the mobile network. Yeah, it doesn't go through, but that's yeah, feasible now. Exactly. Yeah. And with 4G and 5G and prices coming down of those transport, uh, the costs coming down, so now it becomes feasible. Right. Uh, and, and you have some. I mean, I have a smart meter at home as well, which is connected to my uh, Raspberry Pi. So it's only not only sending like every 15 minutes through the, my uh, energy company, but mm-hmm. actually I'm measuring like uh, contents, uh, yeah, continuity. Uh, so I have measurements like every few seconds. Mm-hmm. So, but is that IoT then? That your your specific Raspberry Pi because it, it doesn't like what's the definition? Does it need to go through cloud before? No, uh, I, I don't f- think so. I mean, it's connecting up uh, the sensor and, and making that sensor uh, um, data available somewhere else. In this case, on my Raspberry Pi. But if I would connect the data, uh, the your your Raspberry Pi with a cable to your uh, sensor, would it then still be IoT? No, right. I, 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 yeah, for me it still is because you're you're making this uh, um, this device, this measurement device. You connect it to 
your network oh, and right. if it's the internet or not because in, in my case it stays maybe within my house but actually when i have the same data and i make that data also available somewhere in, either publicly on on my smartphone because i want to look do it from remotely then you can okay. maybe call it the definition gets as well. a bit foggy uh, the, <laughs> the definition gets foggy but I, I do think that in the end it's i guess what is the critical thing is the fact that you have a device that's now sending out data and that's exactly. being processed at another place than at the device right i guess exactly. that's the definition yeah now and now then, this thing has been connected because otherwise it was your like uh, like your power right. consumption meter you right. had to open up your uh, your power cabinet yeah. and look at the actual device yeah now you don't have to do it anymore because and, you can do it somewhere and else. Then there is, and then there is a question of skill, right? So one sensor is okay, but then uh, if, once you have a lot of sensors, uh, yeah. you got to process a lot of data, you know, then it's going to become more interesting. So I still wonder for consumers specifically, like, I guess like I, companies see the clear value of predictive maintenance. Mm -hmm. But then specifically for the consumer side, I mean, isn't there like a big opportunity for companies to leverage IoT there more than they're already doing? Oh, or? definitely. But I think I mean, what you see is um, a good example. Why is Amazon getting so successful? What, they have this, uh, the Amazon button. You probably know of that yeah. as yeah, well, yeah. which is in a way an Internet of Thing type of device. What's the Amazon button? It's just actually a, a, just a button you can have in your house and you can you can press on it. You can pre-program it. You pre-program it and then you press on it. If you're, if you're out of milk, you have the, your milk button. You just pre-crawl program it. Say if yeah. you press the button, then you actually order milk. Yeah, actually, it reminds me. Um, I need need to look up the details, but there was also this this pizza chain uh, in in the US that brought out these special Nike Air Jordans, and then in the um, in the shoe there was you could you could squeeze it, and then it would order your favorite pizza. Yeah, so you could like pre-program your favorite pizza, and then if you were just sitting at the couch with your sneakers on. You 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 squeeze the button and your pizza would come. Uh, so how is this different from uh, from just w clicking on a website that you want to order something? I understand it's that not, it's convenience, it's, but it's what makes what does it make this? I think I doubt, Internet I doubt, of Things actually. I doubt. I, to be fair, I think that is definitely. I would I would argue that that might not be Internet of Things. So I can uh, uh, imagine, for instance, I, yeah. I you know what if some some thing that. I, so so I, when I press a button, I think I'm communicating, right? So that's not the kind of Internet of Things you're, that you're is not, sensing something. You're not no, continuously but I mean, or periodically taking measurements. Yeah. No. It would be for if you have a smart refrigerator. Yeah. The refrigerator knows when you're taking out the last uh, uh, pile of milk. Yeah. yeah. And then because you're not putting it back, yeah. it knows it's empty, so it will order the milk for you. Yeah. yeah. Then you're probably thinking what, more What would be Internet of Things is if you have a glucose meter in your watch, and when your meter, your watch sees that you're getting hungry because your glucose level, your blood sugar levels are dropping, yeah. then it orders you pizza. Yeah. Is this a hint, uh, Jeroen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so maybe, I don't know, It's uh, 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 maybe one other thing we need to also discuss, and it's also a huge topic, is, is security in that sense. Yeah, I, I was just saying that the downside of Internet of Things. Right. Is there is a, because every upside has a downside as well, and you see security, privacy, those mm -hmm. things. And you see that Because I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of, of my dishwasher, which... Could, can be hooked up to the Wi-Fi, but I'm yeah. not doing it because I'm expecting that the um, the manufacturer is only going to support the firmware for maybe two, three years, and I'm intending to keep my dishwasher for maybe ten or long, ten years or longer. Yeah. So then I have an un updated or an out of date uh, firmware connected to the internet you know with all yeah. risks like uh, potential uh, hacking and uh, exactly and you see a lot of uh, the ddos attacks where the uh, ip cameras yeah i mean that's i think that's yeah, quite was, famous what, at that the was, moment. Uh, that was that uh, was one or two years ago that they had this whole swarm of iot devices yeah but it's still of, going uh, on i mean you see a lot of dns the, uh, server and yeah exactly uh, the, 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 the the dns attacks that you see a lot uh, the dns amplifying attacks which is yeah. all it is ip all these iot devices right and I think that's where one of the things you see now that that security uh, and privacy and keeping IoT devices updated from a security perspective, but also from a feature perspective. I think the early IoT devices were like, in a sense, hey, you, you program something, uh, you put it on, on the device, and then the device go, goes out there and it stays out there. And hey, you're not, you're not able to update anymore. And you see these new technologies that are like, oh, hmm. We need to figure out a way to update those devices as well mm. because they might become a problem which we didn't know we put in a, either a bug becomes a security or a privacy issue or we measure something which was fine then but we shouldn't be measuring right now or whatever you want but but definitely the the realm of potential or or or, or new products that will be developed in this space plus the realm of there being enough 
economic pressure to keep those devices updated, they don't necessarily overlap. No, that's true. And I think that's that's where you see, uh, we all know the bad Chinese products, for example, uh, but it could be some, or let somewhere me, else. They overlap, but they don't align 100%. A- right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's not because they were like badly manufactured, but because they're not supported. And the organizations that actually build those products, and this is the same where you talk about your dishwasher, they said, hey, now it's a nice gadget. We have it in there. Oh, by the way, now for the next coming years, we have to make sure it stays secure. That's a completely new business for a company that was manufacturing dishwashers. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why you see that, in a sense, connecting everything to the internet was, in a way, a hype. And now you see the hype is a little bit over. So people start to realize it's not only about connecting it and getting the data from it, but also the maintenance part of it becomes uh, more and more important. And we already said uh, the maintenance part from the power consumption with the batteries is one thing that has solved, but now it's the security and privacy part. And hey, we're now starting collecting everything. How do we cope with that? But the biggest problem there is so in in where actual consumers end up using the IoT devices, whereas the main uh, use cases we've covered are more like on the industrial side. And uh, and, uh, and so is, is that... Uh, is is the security and privacy issues are they causing the fact that the industry is adopting it more than consumers or no? I think the use cases is making it for the industry was was easier yeah. and the more the more obvious. Uh, there are examples. I mean, if you think about from a consumer perspective, there are also a lot of opportunities out there. But the security and privacy risks are yeah. much higher. So that means, hey, I think of this use case and let, let's give everybody this device. Oh, but now I have to worry about these other things as well, which is, hmm, that makes it a little bit less interesting because the environment out there in the wild with consumers is much more harder to control than your industrial complex. So how afraid should we be as consumers actually of this IoT development? Um, I don't think we should be afraid. We just should be aware. You should be vigilant. Vigilant. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and but, I think... But your, your vigilancy is causing you not to connect anything to the internet anymore. Like your well, but I do have a smart term- thermostat. Yeah. Right. So, how do you decide to connect one thing and not the other thing? What's the yeah? Criteria? And, and this, well, maybe, this is yeah. So, for example, what I do at home, I have, and maybe also for the, the people listening, I have two two Wi-Fi networks. I have actually a network called IoT, which is completely separate from my personal Wi-Fi network. All right, yeah. that's smart. Uh, yeah. Is that something you would recommend as well? Uh, yeah, I think it really depends. For example, for for me. It's the same network, but then I scanned my devices. So it depends on where you are and what you want to do to figure out uh, how far you need to go. I think the main importance is, for, it was a good example with the, the, the Tone uh, thermostats. Tone actually built their uh, thermostats uh, from a, a privacy and security perspective ground up. They said, my thermostat, the data doesn't leave uh, the thermostat and just stays in the house, which they thought was a very good feature uh, to sell these things. Now we have all these other thermostats, which are cloud connected uh, and have all these nice geofencing. Uh, uh, so when I'm near my home, the heating turns on or when, when I'm driving away, the heating turns off and all these features. And the consumers actually say, like those thermostats more than the Tone. Now Tone is actually making their device cloud connected as well. Mm. So I think we're still, uh, the example here is that we still have to be aware uh, and we have to learn on what it will be and there is a responsibility with the consumers but Mm. i don't think every consumer is always capable of making that choice so it will be both the consumer and the manufacturer that have both have a part in this but But you're not you're not absolved of using common sense right so i have some iot devices that i use for example smart thermostat being the main one but I chose not to connect my dishwasher because I will need to walk to my dishwasher anyway to do something with it. So, yeah, of you know, course. Why, why connect? It, it also depends on how practical or how useful and what exactly. is the added value of doing exactly. that. Exactly. But yeah. I also think like one thing is interesting is that it, it looks like there is a trade-off between security and cloud, the way you say it right now. So you're saying the thermostat, the, the tone thermostat uh, now became more uh, cloud connected, but it's possible to become cloud connected while still being secure, or even maybe sure. more secure than keeping everything in your... Local sure, but it, that's right. of course implementation on, on the technology side to make sure that you have everything in place. I mean, you can safely connect to the internet, but that means, I mean, if you build something that you connect to the internet, you have to keep it updated because today it's safe, tomorrow there might be new vulnerabilities out there and make it unsafe, so you have to yeah, make sure you can update it again. Uh, and, and that whole process of keeping it, checking it, and, 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 and supporting the life cycle of each individual device. And that's, I think, one of the challenges as well. I mean, when we're talking about IoT devices being billions of devices, but also being millions of different devices. 
I mean, you, you know from your car manufacturer that already has a challenge. I mean, if everybody would be driving a Volkswagen Beetle, that would be the only car that is easy to maintain. But now we have all these different types, which is much harder to maintain for a longer period. This is with Internet of Things devices. Eh? Maker movement is nice, so it's really easy to make 10, but you also have to make sure that you then can support just the 10. Yeah. So there's the consumer side of IoT, and then there's also the more the the industry side of IoT. And I think, yeah. uh, well, especially in the industry side, Anchorman is, uh, has done some uh, some incredible projects so far. So I would uh, definitely also recommend our listeners to look at our our, our website. I would like to thank uh, Patrick Beitsma for being our guest. I, yeah. It was really interesting to talk to you about IoT, and I'm looking forward to your white paper. Oh, so thanks for having that, me. That will be uh, will be published on the website. And of course, thanks to Ron for being uh, 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 the sharp mind that you are. Thank you, Jeroen. And uh, I was a bit foggy at the beginning. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Did we inspire you? Tune in for the next episodes. Or visit our website, anchorman.nl. There you'll find more on bootcamps, AI masterclasses, or careers. See you at the next episode. <laughs>